Hello and welcome. I'm Teal Triggs, Professor of Graphic Design at the Royal College of Art and Fellow of the International Society of Typographic Designers. This month of March brings not only International Women's Day, but in also some parts of the globe, March is Women's History Month, commemorating the diversity and significant contributions of women to history, culture, and society. As part of the ISTD's live stream events, we are very pleased to be able to bring into this conversation the publishing contribution of Hall of Femmes and their new book celebrating designer Rosemary Tissy. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. The International Society of Typographic Designers, ISTD, is a professional body run by and for typographers, graphic designers, and educators. The Society has an international membership that shares and supports its aim to create and inspire interest in all forms of typographic practice. The talks this evening will last approximately an hour, including a presentation and time for Q&A from the audience. We will take your questions via the chat window on the ISTD live page and try to answer them at the end. Unless you register, the chat is anonymous so for everybody's sake, please include your name and location at the beginning of your question so we can get a real sense of who we are uh, and where we are uh, all in the world because uh, this is an international event, which is incredibly exciting tonight. I would like to offer sincere thanks to the folks at ISTD who put together the event. Belinda McGee, Brian Palmer, Mark Peter, David Coates, Sabina Mueller, and Tony Pritchard who have helped to make this evening happen. So to begin, I confess I have a vested interest in tonight's talk. As co-founder member with Sean Cook of the Women's Design and Research Unit, we have through various collaborative projects advocated for raising an awareness and exploring issues that touch women working professionally in the field of visual communication and design education. Our current research project with Lorna Allen of Hidden Women of Design and Susan Potter looks specifically at the brave new normal world of a post-pandemic world of women in the workplace. I'm excited tonight that it may be some of these things we might explore around the history of women in the profession of graphic design, its canon and how design history is written, the role of collaboration and practice and the changing nature of design publishing today. To do so, we're absolutely delighted to have with us Samira Buabana, a Swedish Tunisian designer, teacher, and publisher based in Stockholm. Samira is also an assistant professor in graphic design and visual communications at Beckman's College of Design. She is one of the founders of the Hall of Femme. Angela Tillman Sparadino is the other, and collectively they founded Hall of Femme in 2009 which aims to revise the history of design and inspire and raise awareness of gender equality within design, architecture, and communication. We are also very pleased to have with us in conversation Michaela Green, a graphic designer who co-runs with Linda Holster, the small concept and design studio Holster Green, founded in 2018 in Malmo in the very south of Sweden. Now what links Samira and Michaela together is Rosemary Tissy's book, where Michaela was photographer and art director, and Linda, who's not able to join us this evening, was the book's writer. And of course, Samira being the publisher. The roles have been intertwined uh, between these women, and it's that conversation that I'm interested in having around collaborations, how women work together, the profession, and how we might look forward to the future all in celebration of Rosemary, Rosemary Tissy's book uh, and the conversation we're getting ready to have. So thanks very much. Samara, now that the housekeeping is order, I'd like to turn the screen over to you to learn more about your work, Hall of Femmes, and this fascinating project. With her mantra on the front cover, which I believe we all have a, a, a copy of the book now, uh, experiment first, organize later. Great, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Samara. Thank you, Teal, for the nice introduction. So I'm going to do a quite quick uh, presentation of Hall of Femme and the background of it uh, so that we could turn over to the talk a little bit quicker, maybe have more time for that. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. 
to do so. So you see, you see my screen. Good. Uh, yes. Yeah, so like I like you already heard, I'm Samira Bobana, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about. It's the book series Hall of Fame. Uh, nowadays, we concentrate our work to the books, uh, and with these uh, Q and A interviews. Uh, in the past, we've done a lot of things, but nowadays we just do the books. Uh, Hall of Fame is a project that started in 2009. This is me and Angela Tilmans Brandio. And at that time, we had a design studio called Hjärta Smärta in Stockholm, the two of us. And we were sort of semi, semi new. We had worked for seven years, so we were just in the stage where you are no longer young and promising, but no, not, you're not uh, a senior either. Uh, so as you will, as you will hear in my, in my story that this person, uh, this uh, project started very personally for us. Uh, it developed to something else, but it started as uh, right there as to two persons having a studio being designers. Um, so when we were at that stage, we didn't know, we started to feel that we didn't really know what our future as designer would look like. We didn't have any examples of, uh, of women designers who had the studio that we could, we felt the need to know someone that we could turn to, to that could tell us what it's gonna be like and what we should do with our studio and our working life. Uh, so, of course, we knew from design school and from, from the design world a lot of, of male designers. Um, and we know, knew their stories and their philosophies and their work. But we didn't know as many women designers. The image I'm showing here is the are the people selected into Art Directors Club Hall of Fame in New York uh, until 2011. Uh, and they're all real except for Don Draper, who is the ones I couldn't find the portrait of. And these are the women that were elected until that year. Uh, so we knew that they were there, but we didn't know as much about them and we didn't know how many they were. So we started to make our own research and we, want, we started to talk to elder male designers about their schoolmates and where, they, where did they go. And uh, we started to research by, by looking in old yearbooks, for example, and just writing down every women sounding name there was. Uh, so we started to create our own list. And this was still, it, it gave us comfort to see this list of name that sounded like women, even if we knew nothing about them yet. So eventually we narrowed down or we decided on a group of women that all lived in the same city and that was New York, because the goal was that we wanted to meet them and talk to them uh, and to, yeah, we didn't have a plan with it. We just wanted to meet them and like ask things and know things and uh, get some kind of future perspective of our profession. Uh, so we, we emailed them and asked if we could meet them and just to talk about their working life as women in the design world. Very vague, but they all said yes. Uh, so I won't go into who they are that much because 
I can give you a hint that they, there are some books about them uh, and it's in the whole fan book series. Not all of them, the, uh, but, but most of them. So I'm going to concentrate more of the overall story here and not the specific books. But anyway, we went to New York to meet them and uh, to have conversations. And we didn't like we recorded the conversations, but we didn't tell them what to do because we didn't know what we were going to do. Uh, it was just those meetings were quite enough at that time. Um, and uh, through those meetings, we also realized that there was a great emotional aspect to meeting, uh, to meeting people of your, of your own kind, so to speak, of, of meeting someone that actually very specifically in this case look, looks like you. Uh, this is Angela meeting Paula Scheer. And it was the first time that she could, again, very concretely envision who she could be as a designer uh, in a few years. Uh, and we realized that learning something or wanting be, to be a part of something could be this very close to each other, like wanting to see something that you would like to be or that reflects you also gives you uh, like the drive to continue to be to be there. Um, so we felt that through this meeting these women this first time, there was a new kind of party that opened up to us. Uh, another kind of party than, than we had thought the design were to be before that. And uh, it was a party full of interesting designers that we didn't know that much about before. This is a napkin that uh, Paula Scheer wrote to us with other names that she, she thought that we should meet. So through the women, we also like, were connected to, to other women. Uh, although, the, although the ones we met at that first time were different to each other in, in line of work or uh, age, or uh, they all knew of each other because they were women designers and also recommended us to meet each other. So during this first trip, uh, we also kept a blog. Um, and uh, documented our meetings through that. And it turned out that what we felt so was so important to ourselves was also interesting to others. And we were got, when we got home, we felt that the meetings we had couldn't stay as sound files in our computers and that we had to do something else. And that was, that was both because it was a big emotional thing for us, but also because uh, because of the reactions and like the comments and the, uh, that we felt that people wanted to hear more. So this is a post where we, the last post of that trip where we said that we, what we wanted to be when we grow up. And it says humoristic like Karen Goldberg, strategic like Paula Scheer uh, and, and so on with the people we met. And then it ends with, and we want to earn as much money as Fabian Barron. So uh, when we got home, we thought of what to do with it. And we quite quickly decided to make it to a book series. And the reason is because we're graphic designers and it was something we already, already like we knew all the parts of, it would be quite, easy to do it for us ourselves in in house um, but um, yeah we decided on one person for one book and not the best of compilation because we wanted each person to talk uh, to have a lot of space to talk and to like delve into their work uh, and all the books are based on personal conversations q a between two generations of designers. So it's very much a peer-to-peer -peer meeting 
and not um, we we don't offer any analysis of the work or put it that much into we put some some of it we put a bit into context but most of all it's uh, through the conversation we do that uh, and we have editors for all books so the first interviews are made uh, made by us and then the editors take take over the text uh, so a little bit more on on why books it's um, we found that also like when we tried to find the information about women designers it was the book titles or the written material that that sort of stayed that you, that you could that you could order somewhere or you could go into the library and and find it uh, they make it into the records in a way that maybe movies or exhibitions don't so if there's a book, uh, people feel that it must be an important person. And then the snowball effect could start with that person being invited to juries and getting bigger assignments or um, prizes or whatever. And, and then suddenly you're a part of the, you could be a part of the canon. And that was what we aimed for. So this illustration is just to show you like this kind of pages where they collect best top star things and in this specific page there were one woman in the list and we wanted to contribute to 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 or sh challenge and change that ratio uh, by showing that there are women what they actually did and how they actually contributed to design history um, but not wasn't that wasn't enough documented uh, or if it was documented at all that sometimes sometimes it wasn't uh, so i don't know how many book designers there are in this audience tonight but it's just a quick browsing through what the, the stages of creating the books are uh, so we'll start with the interviewing and we always meet at uh, at the home or the studio of the designer uh, with the editor or with with ourselves like doing the groundwork and this is at the home of Barbara Stauffoko Solomon in San Francisco uh, and then the editing process sometimes it's about finding the actual work through going into archives or meeting collectors and uh, documenting their collections. Like in the case with Ruth Ansel, it's uh, one, one person's collection and also Lillian Bassman is also collection work. Collecting the collection. Uh, a lot of editing with the material. This is 10 years of uh, Harper's Bazaar in Ruth Ansel's book that needed to fit into a book like this together with other work she did. Uh, a lot of selection editing again. This is Tomoko, the Tomoko Mio book. And then of course, designing layout and proofreading printing. And then the launch. And this is with two of our editors for the Tomoko Mio book and the Lella Vignelli book. So creating a book is an expensive process. Uh, for each book, we apply funds and create, and recently we started to create crowdfunding campaigns. And uh, the driving force may not be the money, uh, but more of it would certainly help creating more books and, and that we also could work more on the distribution and make more out of each book. Um, so, uh, so that has slowed, slowed down the press process a lot that 
uh, that it's a lot of work with finding, finding the funding for each book. So from, from 2009 until now, a lot of the books have been uh, just printing that first batch of interviews that we did during the first trip. And then we have added um, Barbara Stafford Solomon and, and, Rosemary, uh, and Rosemary Tissi after that. So this is a quick commercial break. Uh, we have this on our website and anyone can donate there, but no one ever does, but I still want to mention it. Um, but what is re rewarding though, even if it's not rewarding financially, is that uh, the book finds its way uh, out in the design community and things, attention, Things happen to some of the women who we featured in the book that they get attention and like recognition for work that people had maybe seen but forgotten or didn't know where to find again. So this is an example of Ruth and Sel, who in 2011, I think, was elected into the Hall of Fame in uh, in New York uh, and the jury, one jury member said that our book was on the table when the jury made the decision. So it was very a very concrete thing that they had the book, they could look at the images, they can hear her talking about the why and what and how around her work. And also getting notes like this, this is from Lillian Bassman and Barbara Stavros Solomon who both were in the, their 90s when the books published. Uh, and Lillian writes, I think you did a tremendous job. And that just could be, yeah, you get, you get very happy when you get that. Someone is happy what we did, how we framed their design work. So I was also asked to mention something about what future books or what will happen in the future, what next thing is. And uh, we don't have a book planned yet, but we would love it if it, people, maybe you in the audience tonight, would suggest names to create, uh, for us to create a more diverse book series. And uh, we would like to include more designers from other continents, but we we don't like, it's a lot of research also involved in that. So we'll be happy to, to take help with that. Uh, maybe there's also people who want to be a part of the team and to help funding or fundraising or maybe even create the books to interviews. We're open for all possibilities in expanding the group and, and also the, yeah, the, the world, the world of design. Um, so let's move on to why many of you maybe are here tonight uh, to talk a little bit more about Rosemary Tissi. So Michaela, you are also here. So I'm gonna just say a few things and you can you could also add and talk about the pictures I'm, I'm showing. This is the first images from when we in Hall of Fame invited Rosemary Tissi to Stockholm in, uh, uh, oh, when was it? 2014 or 15, uh, 16, uh, I don't know. And um, uh, as a part of a member organization, Svenska Tecknare, the yearly Congress. Uh, and we really, really liked what she showed. We have, hadn't seen it like that before. As you see, she, she's had the, the photo slides with her. Um, so it took a couple of years, but then we asked her if we could make a book with her. And that's where Michaela and Linda came in to the picture. Uh, and this picture, are they in this, uh, at, the, it's at the home of Rosemary Tissi, where they went to interview her in 2018. Um, 
So they visited her in the home uh, and took the photos and spent a couple of days with her. Uh, she showed them their work, her work, uh, sketches that are very close to final work here. Typographical solution and sketches all made by hand. And uh, glued and uh, scotched in uh, compositions that I don't have the final work of that one, forgot that. But again, very close to the final work every time, very precise, uh, playful and precise at the same time. So I think that we all thought uh, that her work was very inspiring in that way that it feels, uh, yeah, it feels in one sense, I don't wanna say timeless, but it, it's very, always very playful and it, like it's, it's like she has the same method all through her career. This is also sketches she show, showed. It's, this is for the bill competition, right, Michaela? Yeah, this, these are uh, when she was finishing uh, the 50, uh, 50 value bill. Uh, took her about a year, I think it was. And uh, she made all the things uh, by hand at that point of time, even though now <laughs> she's very good at using the computer as well, but she's very hands-on still today. Mm. She was laying it all out on mm. the floors, on the beds, every, everywhere. Mm. This is also some final work and the, the color frames are ours. And so the book is now printed and uh, it arrived just yeah, a week or so, a week or two ago. And I actually just got it in my hand. Uh, and that would be out for, it, it would be possible to order it at, uh, I think in April. Uh, yeah, is that right, yeah. Michaela? Yeah. End of March or beginning of April. Yeah. Don't have the exact date, but. So if you follow us at Instagram, we will definitely tell you when. Um, yeah, that was the introduction to what Holofam is and what we do. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Samira. Uh, really great to have that overview and then starting to, to dig in a little bit around the archive, which I wanna come back to uh, in a moment. So really appreciate uh, both your comments uh, to, to kick us off in this conversation. Um, we're starting to get some questions in, which I'm, I'm going to come to in a minute. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask to kind of kick things off. Um, in the preface to the book, uh, Linda writes, in retrospect, I note the clear difficulty in keeping the conversation in a straight line. I'm wondering if you can, Samira, Michaela, talk a little bit about Rosemary's personality, because I think that's one thing in terms of the book, uh, the writing, the tone of the writing, the use of the interview, so her voice is really coming through, the design of the book to allow that voice in her work, the voice in her work to come through is very significant. And so I'm just wondering, could you give us a little bit of a, a sense of who she is and, and how it was to work with her uh, in, in the apartment, in her archive? Uh, in the production of this book. Yeah, she was a fantastic woman to meet. She's a real creative force. Uh, and well, the, the part Linda is writing about in the preface of the book is that we would ask questions or Linda would ask questions and then uh, Rosemary, she would just take off and we have had to edit uh, what she was telling us in hindsight, hindsight because she was 
telling us so many stories and then sort of winding back and forth. So, but she was, uh, she was very, very warm and open to meet and she invited us. We, we spent three days with her uh, in her home almost the whole time. She came and picked us up in her small little mini uh, and we are uh, three quite tall women, all of us. <laughs> so we were cramped into this <laughs> tiny little car. And um, then we spent three days in her flat. Um, I was photographing the things that we couldn't uh, collect with us but she was also very generous of handing us material and we also had a very good help from one of her um, actually her computer teachers uh, a former student uh, Bruno Margaret he helped us so much uh, with collecting the actual files uh, of TC but uh, yeah she she was very happy and warm and welcoming and never wanted to stop talking really <laughs> yeah i can say that not not i, I only met uh, rosemary when she was in stockholm but uh, more generally like that's the favorite part of doing the books of course is the conversation and the be, spending the time uh with them and the thing that you are noticing in this book how like winding the conversation is that is also like a part of uh, allowing, like because when you read biographies uh, that are very like celebrating, it's also all it's always very straight forward. It's like it feels like everything is a, a success, like everything goes from this to this to this to this. So just allowing a history to be more. Like I didn't know what to do for a while and then this happened and it turned me into doing this and having that thing that is more <laughs> what life is and uh, what I think that many women's stories are that they are more winding, uh, especially in times when it wasn't as, uh, yeah, as uh, clear or easy to pursue something, then you had to find a way to do it in another way and then maybe eventually it led to some like you don't have those really straight stories uh, yeah yeah you you very much get that uh in reading through the interview where she's talking about her early career as well uh again that's something i'm going to come back to but i want i want to kind of stick with um uh, Michaela, you being in the apartment and the, the, the three luxurious days, although I can imagine it was, it was quite a, a lot of work uh, considering how much material it sounds like you had to, uh, to look at. I'm wondering if you could maybe kind of talk a little bit about um, these ideas around the archive. And you know, we learn uh, in the narrative that uh, she has this very substantial archive from you know, a very long career. And I think it's worth saying that she's in her eighties. Uh, she has had a substantial career. She was um, the, the, the better half of Oder Matt and Tissy, uh, the office of, and that the archive is part of that uh, as well. Um, but maybe talk a little bit about some of that material. And there's even this wonderful point in the book where there's a mention of the kind of rustle of papers. So I get this vision of, of um, you all sitting around the table and Rosemary is picking things up and moving things, you know, moving through a story. But as Samira, as you say, it's not necessarily a straight linear narrative. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, because I think the archive is such a key factor in terms of the images in the book and, and that story. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it basically started as soon as we went into the actual door, opened the door, because she lives in a, quite a small uh, place and the whole of Audemars and Tissi's uh, archive from the studio had been uh, moved. Um, into her flat. So there were things everywhere, books everywhere, archives in big shelves. She, she kept her sketches in, 
in suitcases and everywhere. She hadn't been able to order it up yet when we came to visit because unfortunately Audemars just passed. Uh, but she was, all the time when she was talking, she was going through all the material that was placed out everywhere. And we were very much interested also in, apart from, I mean, we were interested in seeing the final work and the sort of, she's very hands-on, as I said. So we want to see the finished work, but also the sketches. And she, she couldn't really understand why we were so interested in the sketches themselves, but we managed to get her to, it didn't take much to get her to dig it all out, but uh, it was, she was, she was all over the place the whole time, pulling things out and she's very uh, lively, even though she, she's, she was 82 at the time. Now she's about 85. Uh, but uh, once she got started pulling all the things and showing, also we did spend quite a lot of time talking about the, the money uh, competition or pitch, or I don't know how to call it really. But, and there she had this treasure of uh, sketches and because they were all made by hand. So it was very exciting for us today when we work so much with computers to see the actual materials that she was using, also the tools. So, um, I don't know if I answered, but. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I think, you know, it's that materiality and it, it's, it's something that uh, we're increasingly losing you know, that tactility of the artifacts uh, in graphic design. Um, and I think the importance, and I know many students uh, that I've been in contact with, uh, see the, the archive as uh, something very new and exciting and different. And I think Samara, I mean, kind of taking this point a little bit further in terms of the uh, women that you have published in this series. And I think Rosemary's is the ninth book in, in the series. Yeah, it's um, the tenth, but uh, we have yeah. one book that is the blog also. Okay, what tenth? Okay, great. Um, but I'm curious in terms of the um, your criteria for selection and the network that was created and being in New York, which I, I you know found really fascinating. Um, is there something about uh, the interest in your books because you are dealing with women at a particular generation? where archives and collecting things, you know, do have this materiality. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about yeah. that process overall in terms of the publishing and yeah. the importance of the archive in your, in your publications. So the women we met were between almost 60 to 90. So they were not quite the same generation. They were like, some of them were more, um, yeah, uh, younger, shortly. Uh, but when it comes to archiving their work, uh, it was very different. Like the, the ones that work with magazines, they hadn't archived it uh, because it's like it wasn't considered anything maybe to, 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 to save. Uh, and uh, like that, that could be a problem over like generally that a lot of women haven't saved, haven't saved their work, but they haven't thought of it as something worth saving. But then there are others like Rosemary Tissi and Paula Scheer who has a very like organized archive. Uh, and when it comes to Tomoko Mio, she also kept everything, but not organized, but it was like, she. At least she had it in, in boxes. Um, so it's like that's a, a part of the process just to find out what the relationship to their own work is. Uh, if, is it like something you don't even want to see again? Or is it something that would be nice to, yeah, to, to show for the world and that they have? It's, it's very different. Uh, was that what you're asking too? In, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and I almost get the sense of um, through the archiving process, whether or not we're, we're in danger of losing things, we're losing that history. And the fact that um, you know, many of the women do have an archive, organized or not, um, mm -hmm. is something that uh, I think is really important um, because that, that does mean there is evidence yeah. of their professional career that, that we, can, we can draw from and learn from. Hmm. That kind of leads me to my, my next question before I uh, turn to the audience uh, and pick up on some of the questions that are starting to come in. But with both of your careers, Michaela and Samira, the books in a way, there's kind of parallels happening. Hmm. And I mean, you talked very eloquently at the beginning about why you started doing this in the first instance, your trip to New York and mm. uh, beginning to create that network um, in terms of uh, finding women that uh, were, you know, uh, role models, uh, potential mentors, people that you could look to in terms of understanding their professional career. Do you think things have changed now? Have we kind of moved on from that generational divide or are we still living in these various parallel universes in terms of uh, the generational aspect of the history of uh, women working in this field. Mm. Yeah, that's so, it's like, it's so hard to know because people always think that their generation is the last one to experience certain things. And then get very sad when the next one experiences the same things. But I think like some things are always getting back better. It's like a, some kind of wheel that goes, I don't know, or a spiral maybe. Um, but some things are certainly better, I think. Uh, it's much more awareness about diversity in uh, like all aspects of, of it. Um, and, uh, but I, I think that one thing that I wish that younger people would do is to reach out more to people who are older, because I obviously thought that was so rewarding to just get all those quick paths to a lot of experience and knowledge that you like would have spent 20 years figuring out yourself. And sometimes I can feel that it's uh, like that when you are young, you should also be very occupied with yourself, uh, but you could benefit from also try to reach out between generations and that I wish that sometimes there would be more works being done, like hire photographers from another generation or, uh, or bring in a calligrapher or a typographer from another generation like in both like from both sides sort of but uh, that it could I think that's why also a lot of men in older men has also appreciated Holofan very much because it also talks about the age aspect that uh, like recognizing that someone has worked for a long time and the kind of experience and the kind of outlook you have when you have when you can talk about 20 years or 40 years instead of the last two years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think also in, in uh, Rosemary's book, um, there is a contribution from Paula Scher. And yeah, I won't, I won't spoil, I won't spoil the, the, the punchline mm -hmm. in her, in her piece, but again, that, um, talking about, you know, seeking other women and not knowing where to find them. And here she comes upon Rosemary and they strike up this relationship, not knowing each other before, but they're both women working in a very male dominated um, profession. And so again, I think that that's a really nice sort of mirroring of the kinds of experiences that you're talking about as well. Um, I want to move to the, uh, the the questions that are coming through because this this is a, a good point where one of the questions really does kind of fit into this conversation, and uh, we have a question from Brenda uh, Dermody in Dublin, and she says, "Can I ask anyone? Uh, has anyone ever declined to be part of the series, the Hall of Fame series, 
or has there been any resistance to being described as a woman designer by any of your potential subjects? Yeah, it has. Uh, Tomoko Mio was, was not interested at first. Um, and because of the reason that she said that she never thought of herself as a woman designer and uh, and she said that she yeah she was I mean all, all of the women aren't feminist or have the same perspective on on being a woman and that's woman designer and that's why we also like insisted on talking to Tomoko because we thought that was an interesting like we wanted to hear more how she how she thought about it um, so we were quite stubborn uh, and asked asked her again like when we did a second trip to New York we asked uh, did you, have you changed your mind yet and um, then I think like a couple of years later she she called us when we were in New York to say that she had thought about it in and that was maybe three years later uh, so like first we we actually met the first time we were there but then she thought about the prospect of making a book that she thought about that for several years and then uh, when she she called us because she was sick and she was uh, she was um, didn't have a long time left and decided that she wanted to do something where her work would be published somehow and then like maybe yeah we were we had been there and asked her so she, she knew that that would be a possibility uh, but she's the only one that we've had like a long going conversation with. Uh, and then, of course, it has been easier and easier to present what it is they're saying yes to. Uh, because the first book with, with um, Ruth and Sel, she didn't know what the format would be or. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was curious about. Um how these women uh, would want to be involved in the production of the book? Or were they all just quite happy to stand back and, and, and trust you to get on with it? Uh, it's also very different from different women. Uh, um, Tomoko Mio was, she was sick during the whole period. So she had the person in between her and us that took care of things. Uh, and, um, uh, Lillian Bassman, she like, she just let her us do it, and then in certain cases, like with Janet Frolic, I wanted her to uh, guide me because she's so good at she's such a good art director with when it comes to like flow in a magazine. So I just want to take the opportunity to have her take on how she, how she thought it would be done. Um, so yeah, there's been opinions also like after the first book that, why didn't you make a coffee table book instead of this, like this uh, soft bind uh, sheet thing. And uh, that's, a, uh, that's a view we got over the years, a lot. Okay, I wanna, I wanna make sure I also say, uh, in terms of Brenda's question, she did say that she thinks it's a brilliant initiative and such important work, and she's gonna buy the whole series. Yeah. You've got a fan there. Thank you, uh, Thank so, you Brenda. Yeah, a, a word for all of us. Um, going on to the next question, which again kind of uh, leads on, uh, Jill from Belfast asked, um, through having conversations with key female practitioners for your book series, were there any reoccurring themes that came to light in relation to working in a historically male dominated industry, such as pay, career progression, representation at management level? Mm. Not really, it's like they represent different aspects through like together. Uh, but one thing could be the thing that like it's not it's not very straightforward it's like it's always reflection around all the choices and like why um what happened when and why and like all all the women none of them had not thought about the fact that they were women it was a messy sentence but like everyone had thought about even if they were not feminist or if they were uh, even Tomoko Mio, she had thought about it. 
turns out. I mean, it wasn't something that she was, or any one of them, like just worked and like didn't reflect on it at all. Everyone had a, an opinion or a narrative or something uh, connected to that. So it's not like a neutral thing, um, but that's the only thing that is in common and that goes the transcendence age and uh, kind line of work or uh, like position and uh, or success or whatever. So, um, but part of that, I, I don't, I can't remember anything now that is that everyone talked about. Okay, no, that, that's great. Um, Jill's uh, from um, another one uh, and it's another question that she has as well from Belfast. Uh, since you began Hall of Femme in 2009, do you feel the representation and recognition for female designers has increased? So in other words, has the landscape changed in over a decade? Yeah, I think so. I, I've, like, I think it's sometimes hard maybe to explain that it, it was a thing to decide to do a book series about women in this format that it was felt some uh, like that's it felt sometimes a little bit embarrassing that to bring the subject up like it would would be I mean to talk about uh, different salaries or that uh, that oh but you don't have a create you don't have any creatives that are women here you just have yeah whatever like whatever subject connected to that was a bit embarrassing at that time or like no but it's not like that here uh, and that has totally changed of course it's much more awareness now and and also like awareness about diversity in in many more aspects than that uh, so I think that that scene has totally changed and, and that there are so much so many organizations and initiatives working for diversity in different ways that just weren't there or not as, vis not as visible anyway. So we've, we've got two questions, again, kind of um, continuing on in this, this sort of vein. Uh, Hilary Kenner from Dublin asks, do you have any insights into how Rosemary viewed her position within the wider Swiss design tradition, which was predominantly uh, male dominated? Uh, by the way, she also loves the series and is going to buy the collection for the college and it'd be a great resource for design students. So you've got another fan there. But I think, um, Samara and Michaela, I think maybe this is a question um, around uh, an individual's uh, impact in terms of uh, wider social, cultural, historical context. And that links, if I might, back to um, anonymous question uh, which had to do with um, Rosemary uh, being quoted in the interview that's in the book as saying that she was running Odermatt and Tissy before she had the right to vote in 1971. And so what other insights into Swiss society uh, were revealed during that interview? So I think these kind of run parallel in terms of kind of social and cultural uh, considerations for, for women working in this particular time. So any thoughts on those? Shall I, I go? I could, yeah, 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 yeah. You go. Um, well, we we did know when we arrived uh, in Zurich um, about the late uh, voting rights, but to actually experience it by someone who was talking about it made it so much more uh, tangible, uh, understandable. Um, and well, it surprised me that, I mean, she had been work, Tissy worked for her whole life, uh, almost on her own as a female. And that was a big uh, insight, you could say, in the Swiss society that there's still, uh, or at least she, she experienced it as uh, still being very lonely as a female designer. 
I mean, she was uh, just before we arrived in uh, her flat, uh, she was uh, actually awarded this big Swiss uh, design award. Uh, but she was still telling us that uh, she was uh, engaged almost never within Switzerland, but she went to other countries a lot, uh, having lectures and teaching, but nearly never in Switzerland. So she was very, yeah, she was quite isolated as a female designer. She had, she talked a lot about Paula Scheer as one of her peers, uh, but in other ways, the society sort of isolated her or both ways, but. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, important to also say that in the book, um, she talks about in the interview section, um, she says, Ziggy always stood up for me and was a fair work partner. So that collaboration, it felt was on a, an equal level. Did, is that what you sensed from, from her conversation with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it seemed like he stood up for her a lot, but she was also very, very uh, stubborn herself. And I think he sort of, uh, he couldn't uh, stand against her. So she kind of forced him to actually push for her uh, because she probably made his life kind of hard if she, he didn't. So uh, I think the tone uh, from Tissy during the, the days kind of changed a little bit around Automat and their relationship. In the beginning, she was much more correct about how she was expressing herself and then we got more and more secrets and I'm, I know she doesn't want us to tell them all so I'm not going to <laughs> yeah but this is published in the book so I think people can um, have a read of that paragraph and and, yeah. and gain some insights uh, in that as well but I think this also Miss Mir, this this shows I think the importance of what these books are doing as a series in terms of revealing um, um, these daily lives, in a sense, these working collaborations with either, uh, you know, male partners or other women uh, in their networks, uh, working uh, professionally with, with clients and so forth. Um, so I think that's, you know, again, that kind of shows the, the importance for uh, undertaking these interviews uh, and the value of, of the series more broadly. We have a, a question from Justin Burns uh, in Leeds, and um, this is going down to the, the, the micro. We've been at the micro, uh, macro level, now we're going down to the micro. Did Rosemary outline the importance of observation of movement and rhythm in her developmental work when a design flowed or didn't connect for whatever reason? Can you, can you say that once again? So did, did in, in terms of, um, Samaria, you showed some of the process work uh, in her posters, her typography even, uh, is, is there something around the movement and rhythm in her developmental work? So, you know, did she know when a design flowed or if it didn't connect in a certain way? How did she know it was right? How did she know she had finished something? I think she was very intuitive, actually. She was experimenting and trying, trying, but she was also very much up in her head, trying things out and sort of analyzing and uh, trying to solve the design problem uh, at hand. And uh, uh, yeah, she was, uh, I sort of lost the thread, sorry. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. It's, it's a kind of musicality, I think, when you see her work, it feels like it's musical. And uh, when she, like when we started to talk about her, about uh, like Swiss style and modernism, and she was always like, no, that's too so stiff and boring. I, I like my things move. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I think she said that, but it, at least you feel that. Um, and I, But I don't know why, but I, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, again, I think that's something that um, the book does quite well in terms of the 
the, the kind of informality of the way the story unfolds and how she talks about her own work. And then the juxtaposition of her work with the text um, so that you begin to get a, a, you know, real insights into not just who she is a, as a person, but who she is as a person has informed her design work, how it looks, why it looks the way it does uh, as well. I want to say that we, we, we're just on the hour uh, yeah. in terms of uh, our conversation. I'm going to have to draw it to a close, but I'm going to draw to a close with, with Justin's um, secondary comment uh, in, in his uh, question. And he adds, uh, fascinating talk. Thank you. Great to have an insight into the archive and background into the development of the series. Thank you, Justin, for that. I couldn't have said it better. Thank but you. thanks both to Samira, Michaela, and Rosemary for letting us talk about her when she wasn't here. Um, mm -hmm. I hope we've done her proud, but it's been um, really fantastic to gain these insights. And on the front of the book, there is the quote, experiment first, organize later. I think this is the mantra. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. And with that, I'd like to draw us to a close. Thanks so much again for joining us. And I um, hope everybody in the audience has gained some new perspectives on women graphic designers. Thanks again, Take and thanks to the ISTD. Take it till, thank you, Michaela. Thank, thank you, everyone. Samira, too. Belinda. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.